Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Bruce. I am delighted to be back as your moderator for debate number 13, Does God Exist? We have had some interesting debates. Some of the previous topics have been free will, human anatomy, evolution, and the fossil evidence. Do prayers work? And last month, we had the historicity of Jesus. Well, tonight, you're in for a treat as we look at Does God Exist? Now, the format for tonight's debate will be as follows. First, we will have David Wood, who is representing the Christian viewpoint here. A round of applause for David. And then also, Hina Databoy, who is representing the atheist viewpoint. So for the benefit of the audience, as well as our timer, the format will be as follows, Mr. Timer. Opening statements will be 15 minutes each. Then we will have first rebuttals at 10 minutes each. Second rebuttals, 10 minutes each. And then conclusions at 10 minutes each. So for the clock purposes, and this is for both of our panelists, make certain that for the first segment, the 15 minutes, you give a green light at 12. I'm sorry, a green light at 10. And it, can both of you see the lights? And then let's go with the yellow light at 12 and a half. And then at 15 minutes, go ahead and give them the final light, which means be quiet before Mike back there shuts off your microphone. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. And then we'll make it easy on you for the 10 minute segments. Just go green at eight, yellow at nine, and then the flashing yellow, which is really a red light at 10. Is that okay with both of you? Perfect. Are we ready, audience? Yeah. Well, let's learn a little bit about our first panelist. Dr. David Wood is a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society. A former atheist, David became a Christian after examining the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He is a contributor to books, Evidence for God, 50 Arguments for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science, also Defending the Resurrection, and True Reason. In addition, Christian Responses to the Challenge of Atheism, and David has been in more than 40 moderated public debates. And he also runs the website, acts17.net. David lives in the Bronx with his wife. Her name is Marie, and he has four sons, Lucian, Blaze, Reed, and Pele. Pele. Yes. Pele. Yes. All right. And I asked each one of the panelists for a fun fact. A fun fact about Dr. David Wood, he grew up in West Virginia in a trailer park. Please welcome Dr. <laughs> David Wood. <laughs> And then also, I'll go ahead and read, since we just have the two panelists tonight, let's learn a little bit about Hina Dadaboy. Now, she spent her childhood practice as a practicing Muslim who never in her right mind would have believed that she would grow up as an atheist, feminist, secular humanist. Hina has been an active participant in atheist organizations and events all around Orange County, California, since 2007. Now, on the national stage, she's been involved since 2011. She is currently writing a skeptic's guide to Islam, and she also blogs on heinous dealings of Free Thought Blogs Network. I also asked Hina about a fun fact about herself, and she smiled and said, Della, I will be attending my first prom this weekend in Missouri. A round of applause for her. So without further ado, let's go ahead and open up. I will invite to the podium Dr. David Wood for his 15-minute opening statement. And let's make sure that we do have the cell phones silenced. It's okay to take pictures and text your friends or whatever, but let's have them silenced because this is being recorded. Is that okay? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Dr. David Wood, you're up.
Well, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Christian Century Toastmasters Club and Backyard Skeptics and Huntington Beach Community Church for arranging this debate. The French writer Joseph Joubert said that it's better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. Uh, I hope we can settle the question of God's existence tonight, but at the very least we'll debate it. I'd also like to thank Hina for representing the atheist position. Uh, some of my best friends over the years have been Muslims, and the uh, psychological pressure to conform and comply is beyond what many of us uh, can comprehend. So I'm always impressed when someone has the courage uh, not only to leave Islam, but also to uh, do so openly. So does God exist? Yes. And I'm afraid there's no way around this, my friends. Um, of course, on a superficial level, we can kind of look around and say, well, you know, I don't see God, so God doesn't exist. But on a deeper level, on a deeper level, everything you see around you depends for its existence on God. Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of quantum mechanics, said that uh, the first drink from the cup of natural science makes one an atheist, but at the bottom of the cup, God is waiting. And uh, it's something I've uh, loved for a long time. If you're convinced that you understand the world without God, uh, keep drinking. Not, not alcohol, of course, but you know, keep drinking to the bottom of the cup, and, uh, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, now, to, to show where this goes, uh, think about what's Necessary. What's required for something simple, something we, um, something we're doing right now. Think about what's required for us to be having a debate right now. I think we'd all agree that we're having a debate. So, what's required for this sort of thing? Well, the first thing we need is a universe to debate in. But the interesting thing about the existence of our universe is that it requires an omnipotent, personal, timeless, immaterial creator. For thousands of years, theists maintained that God created the heavens and the earth. For most of that time, what atheists there were maintained that the universe is eternal. And these seem to be the only two possibilities. Either the universe has been here forever, or you come to a, a limit if you go back in time. Um, much to the horror of atheists, um, 20th century research showed that the universe is expanding, and therefore that we can trace it back to a beginning. Now, since the universe began to exist, we're left with two further possibilities. Either the universe began to exist as a result of some cause, or it sprang into existence uncaused. Now, the second alternative is obviously absurd. Out of nothing, nothing comes. But this means that the universe has a cause. This cause can't be bound by time or composed of matter because time and matter came into existence with our universe. So the cause of our universe has to be timeless and immaterial. It also has to be personal. There are only two, two kinds of causes we appeal to, natural and personal. Natural causes are the kind we appeal to uh, in scientific explanations. Personal causes are the kind we appeal to when we said that someone chose to do something. Now, the beginning of the universe can't have a scientific explanation. Scientific explanations presuppose laws of nature, and nature wasn't there to bring itself into existence. But this leaves us with a personal cause. And since a personal cause who can create a universe ex nihilo, out of nothing, uh, would be powerful enough to do anything that could be done, the cause of our universe is omnipotent. So we know that an omnipotent, personal, timeless, immaterial creator exists, and we know this based on the simple fact that our universe began to exist. But could we have a debate like this in any old universe? No. In order for Hina and I to be debating right now, the fundamental structure of the universe has to be finely tuned for intelligent life. The forces, principles, and constants of physics, certain physical quantities, the ratios between the masses of atomic particles and the properties of elements and compounds have to be just right, or we wouldn't be here. Consider some of the simple forces of nature. Without gravity, there'd be no planets, stars, or galaxies, and I wouldn't even be able to, to stand here at this podium. Without the strong nuclear force, protons and neutrons wouldn't hold together in the nucleus of an atom, and hydrogen would be the only element on the periodic table. Without the electromagnetic force, 
there'd be no chemical interactions between atoms and the molecules necessary for life could not form. Think about the principles of physics that are essential for life. The Pauli exclusion principle keeps electrons from all falling into the lowest orbital. Without it, there'd be no complex chemistry, and we need complex chemistry for life. The principle of quantization keeps electrons from falling into the nucleus. Without it, there'd be no chemistry at all. But the fact that we have um, the necessary forces and principles isn't nearly as surprising as the fine-tuning of the numbers that physicists plug into the laws of nature. These are the constants of physics, the cosmological constant, the gravitational constant, the strong force constant, the fine structure constant. These numbers could have had a wide range of values, and yet the values they actually have fall into the extremely narrow range that makes biological life possible. As the late astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. So we need a universe and we need the fundamental structure of the universe to be finely tuned for life, but just as you can have a beautiful doghouse without actually having a dog, uh, you can have a universe finely tuned for life without actually having life. So the third requirement for us to be having a debate like this is complex biology. So where did Earth's diverse biological complexity come from? The most obvious explanation is some kind of design, and human beings are actually quite good at recognizing signs of intelligence. I mean, if we look around this room right now and ask ourselves, um, you know, did that camera have a designer? I don't know what person designed it, but I could tell by looking at that that it was designed. Same thing with these lights, this microphone, this podium. I don't know who built the podium, but I know someone built it. And based on what many atheists uh, tell me, what are the only things we see around us that didn't require a designer or a creator? Us, human beings, and we just happen to be the most complicated things in the entire universe. Now, if your response is, well, the universe is a big place, and so lots of weird things can happen, I don't think you understand the probabilities involved, and I'd be happy to go over those a little bit uh, later. Um, but until then, I'll, I'll just say that if, if this podium and this laptop require a designer, all the more uh, this, you know, these hands and these eyes would require a designer. Of course, we need more than just biological complexity to do what we're doing. Cats are biologically complex. They don't debate the existence of God. In order to ponder our place in the universe and to ask difficult questions like this and to desire answers and to find these answers satisfying or unsatisfying, we need human consciousness. And it's important to recognize that human consciousness isn't merely having a large and convoluted brain. Consciousness requires what we would call a soul. My atheist friends insist that uh, awareness, thoughts, emotions, hopes, decisions, and so on are simply physical states in the brain. But what, what sense does that make? My beliefs are true or false. It doesn't make a lot of sense to say that this pattern of molecules is true and this other pattern of molecules is false. I have thoughts that are about things. It doesn't make sense to say that this pattern of molecules is, a, is about something. If a scientist examines my brain, he might learn all kinds of things about my brain that I don't know, but he'll never learn more about my mind than I know. If a scientist wants to know what's in my brain, he can give me a CAT scan. If he wants to know what's in my mind, he needs to start asking me some questions. So even though the mind and the brain are, are clearly closely linked in human beings, they can't be identical. They can't be the exact same thing. If the physical world were the end of the story, human consciousness would not exist because the human mind is inexplicable in purely physical terms. Theism, however, uh, is the belief in a God who is immaterial, invisible, rational, creative, and self-aware. Since the human mind is immaterial, invisible, rational, creative, and self-aware, human consciousness fits quite nicely into a theistic framework where God creates not only a world of physical bodies, but also a world of immaterial souls. When it comes to debate, however, we're not interested merely in human consciousness, but with a particular activity of the human mind, the mind's ability to reason. Hina and I are only willing to debate a topic like this because 
we trust our reasoning ability. We wouldn't waste our time debating if we thought that our cognitive faculties, the processes that produce our beliefs, were unreliable. But atheists have a problem here because they generally claim that our ability to reason is a product of natural selection acting on random mutation. Natural selection, of course, favors traits that help organisms survive and reproduce. So if human reasoning evolved naturally, it's because it helped humans to survive and reproduce. Would this give us a basis for trusting our reasoning ability when it comes to questions of theology or philosophy? Uh, no, at best, our cognitive faculties would be reliable when it comes to finding berries or using a spear against an enemy or doing something to attract a mate. Interestingly, Darwin himself noticed this problem. Towards the end of his life, he said, With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Compare this with theism. If theism is true, our cognitive faculties aren't simply the product of natural selection acting on random mutation, and they serve a greater purpose than finding food. So our ability to reason about the existence of God makes perfect sense on my world's view, but it doesn't make a lot of sense on atheism. This means that if atheists want us to take their arguments seriously, they'll need to give us an explanation consistent with atheism, which accounts for the reliability of human reason. Until they do, I'll have to regard their claims as incoherent and self-refuting. Finally, as we debate the existence of God, our reasoning is governed by certain logical truths, the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, various valid argument forms, and so on. When Hina and I present arguments, we're presupposing that there are logical absolutes, rules of reasoning that cannot be violated. If I say God exists and Hina says God doesn't exist, we can't both be right. Because if you say we're both right, you'd be saying that God both exists and doesn't exist, and this would violate the law of non-contradiction. A statement can't be both true and false at the same time in the same sense. But what are logical laws? They're not material objects. You don't learn about them through the senses. You can't see them, hear them, touch them, taste them, or smell them. You'll never find them with a telescope or a microscope. You learn about laws of nature by you don't learn you learn about laws of nature by making observations and forming generalizations. That's not how you learn about laws of, of logic. Logical laws are abstract and conceptual. They're concepts. Concepts exist in the mind. The law of non-contradiction was true before there were any human beings. So the law can't just exist in the mind of humans. If all human beings died tomorrow, it would still be true. In fact, the laws of logic would be true in any universe, not just ours. So the laws of logic transcend time, space, matter, and all human minds. They're invariant, unchanging, and eternal. But if logical laws transcend our world, and if logical laws only exist in a mind, there must be a mind that transcends our world. And we call this mind God. Putting all of this together, we see that in order for Hina and I to be having this debate, we need a universe to debate in, finely tuned laws of nature, complex biology, human consciousness, reliable cognitive faculties, and access to logical laws. The existence of our world requires a powerful, personal, timeless, immaterial creator. Fine-tuning and biological complexity require an intelligent designer. Human consciousness shows that there's a world of immaterial, invisible, rational, creative, and self-aware beings that supports theism and falsifies naturalism. The reliability of our cognitive faculty shows that they have a higher origin than naturalism can provide, and theism gives us this higher origin. Since logical laws transcend our world and only exist in a mind, there has to be a mind that transcends our world. What does all of this mean? It means that even in debating the existence of God, God has to exist. Since debating the existence of God requires the existence of God, and we're debating the existence of God, I'd say God must exist. Well, uh, 
I, like David, uh, would like to thank everyone for being here and for everyone for setting this whole thing up. I will say that we are anomalous among theists and atheists doing debates like this because, as one of my Christian friends says, see, I can have uh, friends from other beliefs, too. Uh, he says that every atheist, given the percentage we are of the population, must have at least three websites to account for the amount of atheism online. But David and I are the exception to that. I only have one. David has three. <laughs> Now, I will not tell you that there isn't any way around my argument because I am far more comfortable with uncertainty, I think, than David is. Um, but I will s present my evidence, and I won't say what I think that theists or Christians think because I may be wrong. I haven't sat down and examined every single one of your sets of beliefs. But, you know, I will present what, what I think. The world didn't come about via chance or blind force, and life did not come about by random mutation. There are natural processes that can account for all of these. There is no problem with thinking that there is no God behind it all. If, uh, so if the idea that there can be this mind that controls everything or some creator force behind the universe, why does it have to be a deity? Why do people come to the conclusion that it must be a deity? And we can actually find that explanation in science. If we look at psychology, if we look at sociobiology, if we look at sociology, human beings tend to find patterns where there may or may not be patterns. Uh, one example um, is pareidolia, where we see faces where there may be no faces. So if you look at Mars, everyone sees a face there, or the moon, you see a face there. And religion, in a lot of ways, is just a social version of pareidolia. It's a way of finding patterns out there in the world and saying, there must be something behind it. There must be something reasonable and rational and similar to human thought processes behind it. Although science shows us that's simply not true. Science is not about settling questions, but about asking them and finding out even more of them. It's the uncertainty principle. It's being okay with the fact that we're just human beings. We're just tiny tiny specks of dust in this giant universe. And there are a lot of things we don't comprehend. I'm fairly comfortable with the fact that I don't comprehend exactly how my smartphone was built. Even though I am in web development, I am in technology. Probably all of us rely on experts for certain things like understanding of geology or astrophysics or biology or even technology, plate tectonics. We rely on experts for these things. Because we do that, we don't automatically assume that these things are magical or mysterious or somehow supernatural or personal. We know that you know there are reasonable explanations for this. Just recently, a probe was launched on a comet. How many of us here could do that? How many of us here could be that guy in that tacky shirt? Let's be honest here. Uh, who, could, who else could be that guy saying, hey, I did this thing? Probably none of us here could, even those of us who are in the sciences, who are in technology. To go back to the idea that human beings sort of find patterns where there may not be any, for thousands of years, theists have not agreed that there was a god. They have disagreed with each other and waged war on each other over which god is correct. So to look at history and say, oh, well, all of them believed in god and there's just a few atheists clamoring to be heard is sort of fallacious given the brutal and violent history and let's just say it, reality, current reality of theism. There may have been atheists in the past that you know, I don't necessarily agree with, who were wrong about the idea that it was an infinite universe, but theists have proven themselves wrong over and over and over again about far more scientific matters than a couple of atheists in the past clamoring about an infinite universe. But again, I won't say what every theist here believes. I won't presume to speak for you. What we see here is a god of the gaps. So it begins with people not understanding the natural processes that drive the world, that have brought the world into existence as we know it, that have caused all the natural phenomena we see around us, from the weather to human reproduction and everything in between. And slowly but surely, the march of science has proven theism wrong over and over and over again about every single issue, and God has suddenly shrunk into smaller and smaller places. Suddenly, God only explains the final cause of the universe, where before God was said to you know, account for every act of human reproduction.
was said to account for every cloud and every leaf falling from a tree. Now we have reasons for that. We understand why that happens. So slowly we're just retreating God into this particular role. And call me an optimist, but I feel like that role is just going to keep getting smaller. So what do we do? What do we do about that? We accept uncertainty. We accept the fact that we don't have to know everything. And just because we don't know everything doesn't necessarily mean that ancient explanations account for it. Now let's talk about the idea of reasonable principles existing, no matter whether or not there are human beings to to think of them. To me, that's a tree falls in a forest argument. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Does it matter? If all human beings were wiped out and logic still existed, I'm not sure if that would even be reasonable to, to talk about because who would be there to talk about it? And if we're going to talk about a powerful and rational being, let's talk about what this powerful and rational being is responsible for. It is not a finely tuned universe. The universe is hardly finely tuned and neither is life. The constants are nat- are constantly in flux. If you look at the latest in astrophysics, you will see that there are all kinds of particles that we don't know about, that we can't see, that we barely have any idea about, that literally blink in and out of existence. So I'm not sure what fine tuning is being talked about here. If we look at biology, we see even even more examples of bad design. I say design in quotes because I don't think it is design. It seems that if there is a creator deity, this deity had a pretty severe lack of foresight. If we look at human reproductive peril, and I say peril for a particular reason, human beings walk upright even though our originating species did not. And that means that the female pelvis is so small that giving birth is a death-defying experience. In addition, most pregnancies don't even come to fruition. Most of them spontaneously abort. So you have a fertilized egg that certain contingents of the United States are very invested in protecting, but allegedly this very well-designed universe causes most of them to be flushed out into oblivion, the majority of them. The pharynx, which is our throat, it's for eating and breathing. You know how many deaths could be prevented if we had a separate tube for eating and for breathing? Instead, children suffer and die. Uh, The elderly suffer and die for the simple reason that we have one tube for everything. Breathing is regulated not by the amount of oxygen that's out around us, but the presence of CO2. So you start choking when you sense the presence of CO2 with sense is the wrong word. But when your body recognizes that there's a presence of CO2, you start you start asphyxiating. The lack of oxygen does nothing for you. And in fact, that has been suggested as a way to humanely uh, euthanize people or animals. It's by pumping the air full of everything except for CO2 and oxygen. There's a laryngeal nerve in the, gir- in the giraffe. The laryngeal nerve loops all the way down to the bottom or the center of the giraffe and all the way back up, meaning 15 feet of a nerve that could have been attached right here. The most sensitive nerve bundles for pleasure in the human being don't facilitate reproduction. In the human female, they are external, and in the human male, they are internal in a place most people don't want to (laughs) go. Not knowing doesn't mean that we do know what we think sounds reasonable. I think it is perfectly reasonable for me to say that we are both right on some level. You are right in that you have a particular belief that guides your life and you feel it is real. As long as you don't impose that in my life, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. But I don't have that belief. Consciousness is not a proof of a soul either. Consciousness, or what we call consciousness, can be manipulated, can be gotten rid of, can be stimulated in certain directions. Out-of-body experiences, feelings of going to heaven and meeting one's relatives, that can be induced with certain electrical shocks and chemicals. It's not that difficult. 
there is no inherent meaning in the chemical symbols in our or signals in our brain. There is no inherent meaning in them, but we do interpret them. They are a part of our biology. They are a part of our bodies. Debate is not a product of some perfectly well-designed universe. Debate is a product of the fact that human history has existed for thousands of years and that we have recorded history and that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And we have the luxuries of living in a well-developed society. Debate didn't happen when we were on a savanna thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Debate happens when we have other people to do certain jobs and we're highly specialized and so I'm able to leave my job which I do a job that doesn't even produce anything physical and come here and have a debate. I choose to focus on human accomplishment I choose to look at human history, and you can find all the explanations there for everything that you need. You don't need to go into some sort of supernatural realm in order to see where human knowledge comes from, where this debate comes from, where consciousness comes from. And frankly, the lack of design that is betrayed by a lot of the problems that exist in human and other animal biologies is enough to question this idea that there is a powerful and a rational deity. Thank you both for those opening statements. And now, Mr. Timer, we will go into our first rebuttals and also for the benefit of the audience we will have time for question and answer at the end so what we'll do mr timer 10 minute first rebuttals 10 minute second rebuttals and then we'll have 10 minute conclusions after that a five minute break to set up the camera and mic stand for the audience and then we'll have a free fall of questions is that okay all right so now with the first rebuttals let's invite dr david wood back to the podium Toastmaster's handshake. <laughs> I was a Toastmaster back in the day. That's what she's uh, referring to. Well, thank you, Hina. In uh, my opening statement, I argued that without God, we couldn't even have a debate like this. And I presented uh, six requirements for uh, a debate like this on the existence of God. Um, first, I argued that since the universe began to exist, it must have been caused and that this cause must be an omnipotent, uh, personal, timeless, and immaterial cause. Um, the only response I caught there was that this is a kind of God of the gaps reasoning. That in the past, uh, theists believe that uh, I think God is responsible for every cloud or every uh, falling leaf, I think is what, is what Hina said. And now we know why leaves fall and we know why clouds form. And therefore, God has been increasingly... Um, pushed out of a job. And I, I have to say that's, that's, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. We didn't go, I mean, you, you could, you could, I'm sure you could find uh, theists who believe that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the, the major things that you would appeal to for um, obvious uh, evidence of a creator would be the beginning of the universe or uh, design in nature and so on. And I don't see how any of those um, have, uh, have been reduced over the years. I think there's a much better argument now, now that we know about how cells work and how DNA works and how uh, the requirements to have a living organism, I think we have a much better argument for design and, let's say, biology than we did back in the day when it was just looking around and saying, look, look, there's a, there's a lot of life around here. It's really, a, how could this happen? So I think we have much better, especially now because we can look at actual probabilities. So as far as the, the God of the gaps, what we're talking about are the same things Christians have been talking about uh, for thousands of years. I mean, theists have been talking about for thousands of years. Um, and when we talk about something like the beginning of the universe or uh, fine-tuning of the cosmos, these aren't things that we don't know about. These aren't, these aren't gaps in, in our knowledge. Is, we, we make these arguments because of what we find, right? We, we, we find that the universe had a beginning. For centuries, you couldn't prove this. Then all of a sudden, you can prove it. Then you, now you have an argument that previous generations couldn't make nearly as well. So when we, when we know that the universe began to exist, we know that time and space and matter came into existence with the universe, then we're led to ask, 
uh, how did this how did this happen? What could cause this sort of thing? And when you examine what kind of cause would be required, sounds an awful lot like God. Uh, second, I, I argued that the, the forces, the principles, and the constants of physics are finely tuned for life, and that this points to an intelligent designer of our universe. Hina responded that the the laws of the universe aren't finely tuned, the constants are in flux. And here, I, I'm not sure, I, I understand what, the, what she was saying with the particles. Um, but that's not what we're talking about with, the, with something like the cosmological constant. Just to give you an idea here, this is, the cosmological constant is the constant that, that drives the inflation of the universe. That's why the universe didn't just you know, get, get pulled back by, by gravity. There's, a, there's something going in the, in the opposite direction. Um, but it has to be finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th power. 10 to the 120th power. In other words, if it, if it went in either direction, then we wouldn't be here right now. Now, just to give you an idea of how unimaginable that number is, there are 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire universe. 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, and we're talking about 10 to the 120th. If I let you randomly select um, an atom from the universe and mark it, what would be the chances of me picking the right atom out of all the atoms in the universe? That would be 1 in 10 to the 80th. We're talking about 1 in 10 to the 120th. If that's not finely tuned, and that's just one of them, there are, there are many, uh, if that's not finely tuned, I don't know what is. And if any divergence from these, uh, from these constants would lead to us not being here, um, if you're going to attribute that to, uh, to chance, then I don't know how we would have uh, a straightforward discussion. Um, Biological complexity, I argue that complex biology points to an intelligent designer. Uh, Hina said that random mutation isn't required. Um, yeah, it is, yeah. If, if, you're, if you're talking about how, uh, how you get from a living cell to what we see around us, um, you definitely need some mutations. Now, you have natural selection acting on those mutations, but on the, on the standard uh, naturalistic model, you definitely need the, that, that's what drives, that's, that's what drives uh, evolution. You need the mutations and you need the natural selection. Um, after this, Hina pointed to examples of poorly designed things in nature. So uh, the female pelvis or the pharynx or so on. Um, I don't know anyone who claims optimal design, that everything is as good as it could possibly be. I mean, I don't even know what, what exactly that would mean. I mean, you know, if you make a tiger, if you make a tiger, if you make a tiger, um, and you make that thing so that it can run a thousand miles an hour, you know, I, I hope you are then going to make gazelles run a thousand and one miles an hour, or, or you're not going to have, uh, have a, a functioning ecosystem here. And so, I, I don't know anyone who says optimal design, everything is as perfect, but that's not the point. Um, you know, this, right here, this is a, this is a, a MacBook Pro. Um, is it optimally designed? Could it be made better? Of course it can be made better. It can be made better right now. Um, there are several better ones that have come out since I got this. Um, those other ones could be made better. And any one you have could be made better. Does that, does that rule out design for this? Absolutely not. So I don't see how Pointing out that I think could be made better uh, is evidence that nothing is designed. Consciousness. I pointed out that human consciousness cannot be explained in physical terms and that this points to a supernatural world. Hina responded by saying that consciousness can be manipulated. We can do things to manipulate consciousness so it doesn't point to any sort of uh, soul or supernatural world. Uh, that's not, that, that, that's not the, the argument. The argument is physical states are not the same as mental states because they have different sorts of properties. If they have different properties, they are not identical. If they're not identical, then one is not the other, then mental states are not physical states. And therefore, they require something that's not a physical state. Well, what is it? Well, what is it that uh, can bear these mental properties. Fifth, I argued that if atheism is true, we have no reason to trust our reasoning ability. Um, if, if I don't know if I missed a response to this, I didn't catch one. Um, maybe she can remind me. But uh, since Hina and I obviously trust our reasoning ability enough, I mean, she, she's mentioned several times that we, you know, we learn as we as we go on, and um, uh, you know, we, we we do scientific investigation and so on. I, I believe any of that, any of that supports anything, any sort of scientific investigation, historical investigation, debating right now, all of this, all of this. If I took 
atheism, naturalism seriously, I look at that and say, my brain was selected to find berries. My brain was selected to find a mate. What business do I have talking about the ultimate nature of reality or the origin of the universe? We weren't made for this sort of thing. Um, but we're all sort of presupposing that we are, that we are made for this. Well, that makes perfect sense. Again, on theism, it doesn't make a lot of sense on naturalism. Six, I said that logical laws only exist in a mind and that logical laws transcend our world, which means that there's a mind that transcends our world. Um, Hina pointed out that, well, we don't know what would happen if we all died, if logical laws would cease to, to, uh, to operate. Um, and here, if, they, if they're dependent on the human mind, then logical laws are just a description of how we happen to think. And if that's the case, if that's all logical laws are, they're just a description of the way human beings think that would, would not apply if, 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 uh, if, if we didn't do them, then it's just sort of a, a description of the sort of things that we developed into. And then this is just how we think. The logical laws aren't anything that apply outside of us. They're just a description of how we think. Well, if that's the case, Think about it. Again, going back to the, the, the argument from reason. If we are just developed, if we're just developed, if, if, if our mental faculties were selected to help us survive and reproduce, um, that doesn't give us a lot of reason to trust these, these laws that we treat uh, as unchanging and just necessary for rational thought. And so if we now throw out logical laws as just descriptions of way we, the way we happen to think, there goes all argument, there goes the debate. So Hina um, says that debate doesn't require a perfectly designed universe. I agree, it doesn't require a perfectly designed universe. I have no idea what a perfectly designed universe um, would look like. Um, what it does require is a universe, and that points to a cause of the universe. It requires a finely tuned universe, because we wouldn't be here without a finely tuned universe. It requires complex biology, because without that, there'd be no creatures to be doing it. Um, it requires uh, human consciousness. It requires um, human reasoning ability, reliable cognitive faculties, and it requires logical laws. But all of these things, all of these things, if we took the naturalistic picture of the world seriously, all of this, all of this is... Uh, I'd say in question, to say the least, but I would just say um, that our experience and what's going on right now would be incomprehensible on atheism. Well, I guess uh, David is starting to speak for other theists as well as atheists um, in saying that no theist actually thinks that every single thing in the world is caused by a deity. Um, I don't think that that's a wrong statement. Many theists do believe that every single thing is propelled and perpetuated and actively involves the participation of a deity. And I noticed he did slip up and say Christians instead of theists. So with that, I think, I hope you'll indulge me in quoting from what I believe is a holy scripture about sparrows falling and, and deities being in control of every single little, even little birdies on trees. And since apparently we're going with six premises to which I did not agree prior, I, I will go with them. Um, the cause must be omnipotent, timeless, and personal. That, I think, contradicts a little bit to the idea that the finely tuned universe does not have to be optimal. If this deity is omnipotent and reasonable and timeless, why would they not create the most optimally designed universe? Gazelles and felines aside, there are a lot of design flaws in this universe that don't have purpose except that they're there, except that they simply exist. So to talk about gazelles and felines and, and animals catching each other and eating each other, how about let it, let's talk about that. This is a, a designed universe where the way we survive is by eating each other. This is, this is a finely tuned universe. We must kill and consume other beings in order to live, be those beings plants or animals. 
So I'm not sure if an omnipotent, timeless, and personal being, this perfect being, would really be able to say that, you know, there's evidence of that being with the finely tuned universe if you're arguing against optimal design. Where does the omnipotence go? Where does this all-powerful, all-knowledge go? Suddenly it's out the window when we're talking about, you know, the human reproductive system. There's no explanation for that other than that we were naturally selected and there was no magical designer behind it. Biological complexity does rely on mutations, but they are not random. Randomness is not what's going on here. Natural selection is, and yes, mutations do happen and are selected for, but there's no randomness about it. You know, if you mutate to be a certain way that causes you to die, you will die. And to go to the idea that we need to, uh, we need to talk about uh, causes, we need to talk about why we were made. That is an inherently theistic argument to say, well, if we were made to hunt berries, we weren't made to hunt berries. That's not what I'm arguing. And in fact, I never made that argument. It was kind of shoved into my mouth a little bit. But instead, human beings evolve through natural selection, and we can do a lot of things that aren't traceable back to our ancestors. This is the shoulders of giants argument. The idea that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have prior human knowledge to build upon. This is part of our survival mechanism as a species. Contrary to what David was arguing that we evolved to pick berries and reproduce, human beings evolved this consciousness that is incredible and is not to be you know, denigrated in any way, I think. You know, we have this large brain, and we have sacrificed a lot, evolutionarily speaking, for this large brain, including, you know, adding peril to childbirth because of the giant heads of our babies. But we, a lot of what we do is based on consciousness. We're born naked, screaming, and helpless, right? We, we rely on each other as a species. We are a social species. And we are far from the only social species, especially if you talk about mammals. There are many mammalian species that rely on each other to, to exist. And we have the most complex societies of all of them. And that is partially because we're able to do this. We're able to reach out to each other. We're able to do that. Uh, mental, as far as mental versus physical states, there is no proof of a mental state that is disparate from a physical state other than what people say they think. So you can say, oh, I have a mental state, mental state, and it's different from my physical state, but we can say your mental state is being caused by this physical state. You are hungry because leptin is being released. You may say, oh, that's a separate feeling, that's a feeling I have, that's a thought I have. There's no need to attribute that to something other than the physical cause, except for you know the human tendency to think we're special and find patterns and everything. I don't necessarily 100% trust my reason reasoning ability. I mean, I have made a few flubs here and there today, so there you go. And in a lot of ways, debate is pointless, because none of us are going to walk out of here thinking differently. None of us is going to walk out of here a changed person. None of you are going to come to me and say, I renounce God. And none of you are going to go up to David later and say, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not going to happen. So what is the point of debate? Ask yourselves that. For me, it's to exercise my intellectual muscles. It's to meet people who are different. But this goes back to the idea of cause. I feel like those who believe in theism, those who feel the need to have a dogma in their lives, do feel a need to attribute a supreme cause to everything, from the universe to a simple debate here today. When in reality, we have created these meanings. We have created these meanings for ourselves. And even theists disagree about what the meaning is. There are theists who would disagree that this debate's a good idea at all. There are theists from my past who would say that this, de this debate is downright sinful because men and women are sitting together and I'm uncovered. <laughs> so to say that you know, there must be this particular cause is, is sort of fallacious because theists all disagree as well. 
right. So to go back to that um, consciousness argument, consciousness can be manipulated physically. I'm not saying that we can manipulate your physical state and then your mental state is something separate that's manipulated. They are one and the same. Electrical shocks, like I mentioned earlier, can be applied to your brain and you will experience a mental state. And you might feel it as a separate thing from your physical state. You might report it as a separate thing, but they are one and the same. Our brains and our bodies are not separate. Our brains are part of our bodies. And in fact, the latest research in human biology shows that our digestive systems actually have a great concentration of neural tissues and that would even affect the way that you think. So if we were to take my brain and put it in David's body, he would not, my thoughts would not transfer. That's not how it would work because he has a completely different physical set to support that brain. As far as logical laws go, again, if there were no human beings around to talk about these things, and heck, even back in the day before human beings sat around talking about these things when we were too busy picking berries, I believe was, was the phrase, um, were, was there concern over this? Were those theists debating logical laws and using that as proof? Were those theists using the cause of the universe as proof? No, they were using the simple things, the sparrows falling and the clouds forming. Thank you very much for those first round of rebuttals. And also, if some of your friends missed the debate tonight, let them know it will be streamed in one week at BackyardSkeptics.com. I did receive word that this one is not live right now, but that's okay. You'll have the sneak peek preview and your friends can see it later. And now, Mr. Timer, we will go to our second round of rebuttals. And again, this segment will be 10 minutes. So we will invite Dr. David Wood back to the podium. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, compliment Hina briefly on her, uh, her organizational skills. Um, I've been in lots of debates and I, I haven't seen too many people who sort of go point by point and stick to it through, throughout the debate. It's kind of a uh, one person offers an op opening statement, and then from then on, it's kind of a free-for-all of anything that pops into anyone's head. And uh, so it's, just, it's uh, interesting to, to, be, to be going back and forth kind of point by point. Um, uh, Hena began by saying that some theists uh, do believe that uh, God causes everything that happens. I, I didn't deny that. I granted that. What, what my point was, when we're talking about scientific explanations and how we're bringing God in as, a, as kind of a hypothesis to account for something that, that we just can't account for, the things that atheists say that we were doing that with are almost never the things that anyone has ever done that with. What, what historically, but before the modern scientific age, people were appealing to God to, as creator of the universe and as creator of life. These are the things you find uh, in the Bible or in the Quran, so on. Um, and so, and those are the those are the those are the very issues where we keep finding more and more evidence, not less and less. It's not God getting wedged out. Uh, it's it's the, the the gaps that cannot be filled by anything but God become clearer and clearer. Um, and by the way, you, you can you can flip that. You can say it's a it's a kind of uh, chance or an I don't know of the gaps. Anytime we get we get to something that this is something that can only be accounted for by appealing to a creator or a designer or something like this, and say, well, you know, uh, we don't know everything yet, and or or chance or chance explains it. You can do that with all kinds of things. Um, but again, we're not going with uh, with gaps in our knowledge. We're saying this is these are things that we know, and these are things that we know, and here's what is required for these things that we know. Um, as far as you know, the origin of the universe or the fine-tuning of the universe and biological complexity, um, the sort of response that was kind of uh, put into all of these is: if God is omnipotent, why not make uh, why not make a better universe? Um, as far as the origin of the universe, the, the point of the argument is: if you have creation ex nihilo, if you have if, if you can go back to a beginning of the universe, a being that is capable of bringing a universe into existence would be omnipotent. It would not be made of matter. It would not uh, be bound by time because time and matter and so on are, are coming into existence with the universe. So that's the point there. Um, 
but if you're going to say, well, you know, I can imagine how God could make it better. Um, God could do this or God could do that. Um, I'd like to know what atheists mean here, because now we're on a completely different argument, which is something else that I would say is required by us even having this conversation, having this debate. If Hina is pointing out that she can spot things that are, are wrong with our universe and that a, a, a truly omnipotent being would be required um, to, to do if this being uh, is, is really good, uh, on what basis? Right? In other words, think about this. If, if, if we're just going with sort of nature, the, the natural world, we, we, we kill and slaughter each other all the, all the time. We see this. We know how this works. Um, that's the world we live in. We have no experience of a world other than the world we live in. So how do we know this would be better if this were some other way? We're presupposing a kind of moral law here. Um, where do we get that? You don't get it on naturalism. In other words, let, let, let me put this differently. Given a naturalistic framework, where do we get our moral values, the things we appeal to and say, this is what a good being must do and that is something uh, a good being must not do? Where do we get that? You only have two ways. You only have two directions you can go to as, as a naturalist. You can say that certain uh, patterns of thinking and values are sort of hardwired into us by the evolutionary process. So certain, uh, certain features of our ancestors helped them survive and reproduce, so a kind of herd instinct helping out other members of the herd. Um, or you can say it's got something to do with society. So society indoctrinated us into thinking that this is right and that is wrong. Uh, which one of those do you get to, get to apply as some sort of objective standard that would apply even to God? And the answer is, if you really take your own worldview seriously, you couldn't apply either one of those and say, this is what a, this is what a deity uh, would have to do. Um, if you're, it, it would make no sense to say, here's what we are hardwired to do biologically, and therefore, those are the rules that God must follow. I mean, a, you know, a, a lion will enter a new pride and, and kill off the, the children of the of the you know, of, of the, that were there previously. Um, you don't say, well, if that's what helps that lion pass on its offspring and its genetic material, therefore it's the right thing to do. Well, if we developed in the manner that we're, we're told by the naturalistic worldview, what sense would it make? What sense would it make to say, well, here's the, way, here's the way we think and here's how we do things. This is what we're hardwired to do. Therefore, if God exists, that's what God must do. Uh, and similarly, if you're going to say, you know, it's societal indoctrination, we hear as we're, as we're raised what our society tells us is right and wrong, uh, that's not objective either. That's nothing you could apply to God. Um, one society says do one thing, one society says to do something complete, completely different. So atheists just don't have anything in their worldview that they can say, here's my worldview, but if God existed, here are the things that would apply to him. But we're all, and atheists in general, it's very, it's very rare, you find plenty of atheist philosophers and so on who will go on to say things like that. But uh, among, you know, among your average atheists, very quick to say, this is what God should have done this, and he should have done that, and should have done this, and should have done that. And so we all have these sort of rules that we understand, um, that, 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 that we are so confident in, we will say, these apply even to God. And what does that require? One, it requires that there are moral absolutes you don't have them on that. You don't have moral absolutes on naturalism. So even in making the argument, you're presupposing an absolute moral standard. And you're assuming our knowledge, our access to them. Not just that there are certain things that are ultimately right and ultimately wrong, um, but we have some kind of access to them. We're special. We have a special awareness of things that other uh, creatures and organisms uh, don't have. And all of that, all of that would fit very, com those sorts of, uh, an absolute moral standard and our access to them, that fits very comfortably into a theistic framework, doesn't fit very well into an atheistic framework. Um, as far as human reasoning is concerned, Hina said that human beings can do things that are not traceable back to our ancestors. Well, we do, but as far as the structure, the structures of our, of our, our physical structures and so on, there's, there's only one way that's, that sort of thing arises in naturalism, right? It's, it's survival and reproduction. Whatever helped your ancestors survive and reproduce, those are the traits and characteristics that get passed on to the offspring, and that's what we have right now. The only reason we're here right now, according to naturalism, is our ancestors 
did a better job of surviving and reproducing. It's not because our ancestors um, had some ability to form correct hypotheses about the origin of the universe or about the ultimate nature of reality or whether God exists or doesn't exist. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, whatever helps you survive and reproduce, that's what helps you pass on your genetic information. And so the structures that we have, our brains, um, our physical structures, that all gets passed down to us. And so I just don't know um, what she means with these uh, that we have abilities that are not traceable back to our ancestors. How do we, I mean, you know, you can learn karate or something like that uh, from someone else, but as far as your physical makeup, that does come back, that does come down from your ancestors. Um, Hina said regarding consciousness that uh, there's no such thing as a mental state that is different from a physical state. Um, no, absolutely not. You can give examples of physical states that are tied to mental states, like pain, right? You get, you get poked with a pin or something like that, it hurts. There's obviously a connection there. Um, but there are mental states that just cannot be described. They can't be described in physical terms. Again, if I talk about um, uh, me having, if I, if I have a, if I'm thinking about a, uh, a grilled cheese sandwich, it doesn't make any sense to say, look, you see these, you see these molecules right here? You see this pattern of molecules? That's about, that's about a grilled cheese sandwich. This other, this other pattern is not. Or this pattern of molecules, that's true. This other pattern of molecules, that's false. What sense does it make to say that this arrangement of molecules is true and this other one is false? What do you, I, I don't, what could that possibly mean? But it makes perfect sense to say this belief is true and that belief is false. As far as logic, um, I didn't catch any additional uh, response, I don't think. Um, but uh, Haina said something interesting, that debate is pointless because we're not going to change. And I find that interesting because, I mean, I, I grew up as an atheist, and now I'm not anymore. And a lot of that happened after I met a Christian who ticked me off so bad, I decided to destroy him, and then I started studying and, <laughs> and then became a Christian. And, and Haina, of course, is a, is a former... Muslim, who's now an atheist, so something happened along the lines um, that, that, that made her think otherwise, and so people do, people do un, unquestionably um, change, their, change, their, change their minds and change their views, and the purpose of something like a, a debate like this isn't just uh, an intellectual exercise or to meet new people, it's for, for both sides to be exposed to uh, the reasons that the other si side has for thinking the way they do and coming to some conclusion about uh, maybe I'm on the wrong side here, so uh, I hope you guys, there's some atheists back there, uh, will continue to think about these things, and maybe you agree with me. One debate is not going to suddenly flip anybody's mind. A series of thoughts and processes and debates and discussions and information and society and exposure, that's what changes a mind. Maybe in David's case, he went to a single debate and suddenly his brain went, oh no, God, from atheism. But I know that for me personally, it took me years of self-reflection and thought and pondering, being challenged both gently and roughly by the people around me because being a Muslim in this society is not easy in that way. It's a complex process. And that's exactly what brought about life. That's exactly what brought about the universe. It's a complex process rather than a single moment of creation. God is getting wedged out of explanations. I'm not sure what history we're looking at of theism. Perhaps we should exchange information later about what we're looking at. But God as an explanation is being wedged out. Before, as I mentioned, and I'm not sure if I had made myself clear enough, everything was attributed to God. And that was the end of the discussion. God made the rain. We pray for rain, and then rain doesn't come. God must be mad at us. These are things that are established within theistic canon, in every theistic canon. And to ignore that part of history and to say, all of a sudden in the 21st century, that theists never believed that the rain was caused by a deity is very ahistorical and, and very bizarre, I think. As far as the basis of morality goes, let me back up and quote what the word was used. Optimal. I didn't say that it was good or morally right for women not to die in agony in childbirth because of poor pelvic design. 
I'm just saying it would have been more optimal. So, as far as optimal goes, I'm thinking more along the lines of efficiency. It would be far more efficient to only have sperm meet egg when that would end up with new life, rather than having so many happen and all of them just flushing out for no apparent reason. It would be a lot more efficient for the nerve in the draft to connect here instead of all the way around and up here. So it's not a moral good that I'm arguing, merely efficiency, which anyone with an engineering or design or software background will know, human beings are really bad at. But even I as a human being who's really bad at efficiency, even I can say that there is something kind of inefficient and not incredibly intelligent about some of the designs out there in the world. How do we know that it would be better for, for most things to not die? Well, because life is generally a, a good thing. Good? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty, it seems pretty reasonable on a very basic level that if you want to make something, you won't make it kill itself before it would come to life. That seems kind of ridiculous. But you know, who am I? Who am I to say that? Um, as far as morality goes, um, to use the term hardwired with regard to human beings is incredibly flawed. There's very little that's hardwired into human beings. What makes us the dominant species on this planet is our plasticity, our ability to evolve and adapt, our ability to think about things and come up with innovative, creative solutions for all kinds of problems. I didn't say that none of our structures are traceable to our ancestors, but karate definitely is not traceable to the very first human beings that walked the African savannas. It was a karate, or any other complex concept, comes from a progression of intellectual proceedings that sort of built on each other. So it started with someone saying, oh, man, that guy goes down faster if I hit him here instead of here. And then it built from there. We have thousands and thousands of years of recorded human history that shows us exactly how to get to karate or any other complex concept. As far as morality goes, I was kind of waiting for that one. They, the structures of morality that we see around us are not objective. I don't think that there is an objective morality because an objective morality very clearly does not exist. If an objective morality existed, then we wouldn't be disagreeing about it. Then we wouldn't be murdering and pillaging and doing all these awful things to each other over moral principles. So there is no objective morality that we know about. What we do know is that certain things make for a better society and a better survival for all of us. So instead of me stealing all your stuff and running off, I can say, all right, this is your stuff and this is my stuff. We good? Okay. Although, you know, in, in certain societies, that's not what happens anyway. The bottom line is that there is, an object, there is no objective morality. We can see that in, in this world. And it's another symptom of, I think, poor design. If there were this optimal creator, why not make it so that we're a little bit less horrible to each other? Maybe a little, a little tiny bit? But I guess that's just too much for this, for this deity, if there exists one. Where is this mental state that, that David was talking about? He's saying, okay, so you have a thought and it's about grilled cheese, I believe. Where is this thought? Where does it exist? We know that he's telling us using sound waves and his throat to vibrate the air and sound waves to, to tell us that he's thinking about grilled cheese. But where does this thought exist? This thought does exist on a physical level, on the molecular level. And that molecule in itself definitely does not have a true or false value because people have false thoughts all the time. It's really easy to get people to think false thoughts, ridiculously easy as a matter of fact. But what David did was take this sim chemical signal in his brain and interpret it to mean grilled cheese. Now, if that same signal were to be placed, let's say if this were possible, in someone else's brain, someone who never heard of grilled cheese, they would get absolutely no meaningful information from it that would lead to grilled cheese, but it might lead to 
square thing with brown edges and yellow stuff peeking out. But the bottom line is that he interpreted this information, but the information does exist. There is a physical, traceable bit of information that he's getting that from. As for the idea that reproduction drives every single thing we do, sure, yes, naturalistically speaking, that's true. But we have very complex mating rituals these days. Very complex indeed. Being well educated, educated enough to sit on a stage, might have been part of what led him to have his four fine sons. You know, the fact that he was able to show his intellectual abilities and his health and his prowess in being able to do these things was probably not inconsequential towards his reproductive fitness. Of course, it's a little bit different for women, because if you want to pursue intellectual things, you wait till your womb's dried out, and then you hope for the best. <laughs> but everything, in some way, does lead to reproduction. You know, what is part of the reason I joined the atheist community in the first place? To meet people. So it's not that there's this direct line between every single thing we do and having babies, but there is something behind everything that we do that does lead towards our species surviving and thriving and hopefully eventually reproducing. But you know, there is no there is no person on this planet who is at all reasonable who would say Oh, well, I'm a naturalist, and that means everything I do, every single thing I do is so that I can get someone pregnant or get pregnant. That's not, that's a very simplistic view of human psychology and biology. So I return again to uncertainty. Despite what has been said tonight, theists did explain everything via their God throughout human history, theists of all religions and pretty much every religion, and that explanation has slowly been retreating. Maybe someday we will have someone who can explain away the final cause of the universe in a way that is not theistic. I don't necessarily say that I have that answer, but I can say that it's highly likely, given the progression of human history, that we are going to get there. And I'd rather be on the right side. Thank you very much. Again, this is debate number 13, Does God Exist? We've had opening statements, first rebuttals, second rebuttals. Dr. David Wood with the Christian perspective, Hina Databoy with the atheistic perspectives. And now let's move to our conclusions. Mr. Timer, this segment will also be 10 minutes. Let's have a green light at eight minutes, a yellow light at nine. Were we having a five minute break before that or before the Q&A? It's gonna come after this one right here, no problem. Mr. Timer, did you get those instructions? Okay, Dr. David Wood, you'll come on up with your 10 minute conclusion and then we'll have Hina Databoy. Hey, you're here. <laughs> Let's talk about Scooby-Doo for a second. Um, if you remember the, the old uh, Scooby-Doo show, some of you are too young, but uh, on Scooby-Doo, you know, every week there were, uh, you know, a new monster, a vampire, a mummy, uh, something else. Um, and by the end of the episode, the mask gets pulled off and it's a carnival worker or some businessman is trying to scare everyone off and so on. And so there were, there were, there were always uh, natural uh, explanations for, for what was going on. And then all of a sudden, there's uh, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, where it turned out to be real zombies. Um, don't know if you saw it, but uh, there were actual zombies in this episode. But Fred, uh, the skeptic, just keeps trying to deny that there are zombies. He keeps saying it's a projector. It's just a projector. It's just a projector. And then, you know, he makes physical contact with one. And then it's, you just pull off the mask, pull off the mask. And he, he tries so hard to, to pull off this zombie's mask that he ends up pulling the zombie's head off. And the zombie is still uh, living. And the zombie picks its head back up and puts it back on. So Fred says, it's animatronic. So now it's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's someone actually, they're machines. And pretty soon there's zombies coming from every direction. And uh, Daphne says, uh, Fred, are you saying this is all animatronics? She says, you're not a skeptic, you're in denial. And, you know, this is just a cartoon. There's no, there's no uh, not, not taking zombies seriously here. But, but, but the point is interesting. Fred, you're, you're saying that you're a skeptic here. You're claiming that you're a skeptic. 
If you're really a skeptic, if you're really a skeptic, you shouldn't just be skeptical of supernatural explanations. You should also be, uh, you should also be skeptical about natural explanations when they really just don't account for what you're trying to account for. And I, I think that is a, a valid principle. Um, anyone, anyone can uh, apply their skepticism to something they don't want to believe in and become so skeptical that they don't believe in it. And, uh, you know, you can do this. You, you could sit down right now and make a list. Here are things I want to believe in, and here are other things I don't want to believe in. For the things I don't want to believe in, I'm going to be so incredibly skeptical that no amount of evidence could ever convince me. And for the things that I want to believe in, I will lower my level of skepticism to the floor so that anything qualifies as clear proof that this thing I want to believe in is true. Anyone can do this. Anyone can do this, theists, atheists, whatever. Um, but once we're aware of it, we should, try, we, should, we should try to control it and make sure we're applying a consistent standard. Um, now, let me go through uh, just a few things here because they kind of, they kind of uh, uh, sum up a lot of what's been going on. Uh, on the one, I've never understood the point of, of Hina keeps saying that I said no, no theist has ever I didn't say that from the very first time I said it. I said, yes, you can find theists uh, down through history who, who have attributed um, everything that happens to, to God. I'm saying that's a different sort of thing than what was brought in uh, where you needed God as an explanation for something. Um, we need God as an explanation. That generally, that generally was for things like the origin of the universe, or why certain things are right or wrong, or um, how um, living things formed, and so on. And so, those are still the things that we appeal to. Yes, you can find theists who believe all kinds of things. You can find theists who believe pretty much anything you want to believe down down through the ages. We're talking about the general, uh, the general thrust here. And what would it mean? When a scientist believes that he has an explanation, that explanation turns out to be wrong, and later on he comes up with another explanation, does that say, oh, you know, his old explanations are getting push, pushed out, science is just nonsense now? No, you don't say that. You say, oh, so-and-so was wrong about this, and now uh, he's, he's getting, uh, you know, he's got an argument. In other words, you can't say, this view failed at this point, therefore... You can never uh, appeal to that uh, regardless. Again, I mean, you can go to the opening chapters of, of Genesis or anywhere. What are they talking about? They're talking about the origin of the world, life, uh, things like that. Um, efficiency. Well, this is uh, interesting. He argues that the, de the design isn't efficient. Um, and she says, how do we know that something would be better because life is good. Life is a good thing. That's exactly my point. That is a moral statement. Now, I, I, I'm not saying you don't know this. I'm saying you do know this, but it makes no sense on an atheistic worldview. You have a view according to which we're molecules in motion. We, des we, develop, by, uh, we develop by certain processes. And you know what, what really governs the process is survival and reproduction. Um, we're all going to die and why is why is that uh, bad everything that lives is going to die why would you say that that's bad that life is better that life is good there's no basis for saying it on your worldview and yet you would say it and so we have to ask where that's coming from um, and to tie in with this Hina says that morality is not objective this is very interesting. Um, she says that certain things just make for a better society. A couple of things here. One, there goes any of the arguments um, about bad design. Notice all of the arguments on bad design presuppose a kind of moral aspect. Um, the, the reason you don't complain about this laptop doing uh, not nearly as much as it could if it if it were designed better. Uh, you you never you, you never use that because you know no one's suffering as a result of this laptop not being much better or something. Um, so you only really say this is poorly designed if it's leading to some kind of uh, some kind of suffering. But if morality is not objective, then how do you say that anything would have to do that? In other words, we have here a perfect a, a, just a perfect example of this sort of tension, and you find this tension all over the place. 
Um, Dawkins said it, for instance. So on one page, Dawkins will say that, you know, the universe just is bottom. Is There's no meaning and there's no right and wrong. It's just we're, we're, we're machines for propagating DNA. And then we'll go on to condemn all these sorts of things that are wrong about the world, right? And you don't notice the tension, right? And so it seems on one level you notice, hey, certain things are, are wrong in an objective sense or right in an objective sense. And then turn around right around when you're challenged, what's the source of that? Oh, I'm not saying there's anything that's objective about this. Well, then you have to drop the argument. You can't, you can't appeal to values that God would be required to follow if they're not objective. Um, Haina gave a, a, a good example. Of, well, well, what I had mentioned that, that about karate. Uh, karate, yes, you can learn things over time, but that's completely consistent with you, your structures and abilities having been uh, sort of selected by natural selection over time, you have all those abilities. Yes, you can learn all kinds of things, but the things you learn have to be consistent with the sort of thing you are. Um, you can take a, a bowl of oatmeal and try to make that laptop out of it. It's not going to work. But it's not the sort of thing that can, that can become a laptop. You need, certain, you need something with the ability to become a laptop in order to even make it into a laptop. Similarly, you can learn karate. You can learn karate given the abilities that you are selected for. Um, what you can't do is if you have uh, processes, if your cognitive faculties were selected because they helped you find food and helped you find a mate, you can't then say, and they're reliable for telling me about the origin of the universe or the meaning of life or uh, you know, moral values and so on. It just doesn't apply. And yet, again, uh, our atheist friends are, are, are kind of having it both ways. Here's how we developed, but we're going to, we're going to argue like that's not how we developed at all. And, you know, you kind of have to pick one. Um, Hina says, where's the thought that's not physical? Um, but then she went on to say, yes, those molecules do not have a truth value. That's precisely the point. If the molecules do not have a truth value, but your belief has a truth value, there's a problem there. You can't, and it seemed the way where she was going with this is, you know, this is just my interpretation of this brain state. No, some of my beliefs are actually true and actually false. Um, they are, if they correspond to reality, they are true. If they don't correspond to reality, they are false. But you can, it makes no sense to say, here, let's map out this brain state and map out this other brain state. They're both just these patterns of molecules. This one's true and this one's false. It's not, in other words, it's not the sort of, it makes perfect sense to apply to one and not to the other. The point here is, if two things are identical, if they're the exact same thing, then they have the same properties. They can be described in the same way. Water, H2O, two different terms, but they have the exact same properties. That's how you know they're the same thing. If you're talking about uh, mental states and physical states in your brain, they don't have the same properties and can't be described in the same way, and they can't therefore be identical. If they're not identical, then your mental states can't be completely described in terms of the physical, and they require something else. In naturalism, there is nothing else. You've got nothing else. You've got particles in motion. That's what you have. You have particles in motion. You have natural laws. You have time and space. If your if mental states cannot be described in those terms, then you need more in your worldview. I have something more in my worldview. And finally, uh, I think Hina's uh, misunderstood when I'm talking about reproduction. She's saying, uh, I say reproduction drives everything we do. That's not, the, that's not the point of that at all. The point of the reproduction is everything that you are now was because of the way your ancestors were in terms of your physical structures. And so... Uh, if that's the case, according to naturalism, then you can't then say uh, you have these abilities, physical abilities, that your ancestors didn't have. And Hina concluded by saying she'd rather be on the right side, but what is right on her worldview? I guess I should have worn an ascot today to embody this Fred that apparently I am from Scooby-Doo. Um, I will be the first to say that I don't necessarily claim to be a skeptic. And I did want to believe in God, believe it or not. You, I'm standing here today arguing against the existence of God. It's not because I wanted to be here. As my intro stated, I would have never believed I would have ended up being here. I did want to believe in God. I looked for evidence. I sought it out, and I could not find it. 
So I'm not sitting here doggedly persisting in some belief because I really want to believe it. I spent years searching. I spent years sitting there and trying to figure out what made sense. So I do take a little bit of uh, exception to the claim that I am doggedly anti-deity. Efficiency is the least use of resources to achieve the most result. There's no inherent morality to it. There's no inherent good or bad behind it. I may have misspoken when I used the word good. I didn't even necessarily say that death was bad. And in fact, I don't think a theist has a leg to stand on when they say death is bad because their deity created death. Their deity designed a world, allegedly optimally, or non-optimally, I'm not sure, where death is part of the way that we exist. As far as science goes versus theism, science has a built-in self-correction mechanism called the scientific method, where you take a hypothesis, you test the claims, you figure out your conclusions, you change your conclusions based on the evidence, and so on and so forth. Theism, on the other hand, has built its entire history on saying, we are right, we will always be right, and we will never change, despite the fact that we see changes as we speak. We see religions, well, let's say theism, to be more precise. Theists have changed their arguments over time, despite the fact that they claim that it never changes and it's always correct. Science never claims to be dogmatically and completely true forever and ever. That has never been the central claim of science. The central claim of science is that we need to find more evidence. We need to prove ourselves wrong. Scientists love this. This is what they live on. As far as laptop design goes, I'm not really sure if that's relevant because I don't think that we think that the person who made the laptop was omniscient, with all due respect to the dead Steve Jobs. We don't claim that this laptop has to be as optimal and efficient as possible because we don't think that the person who made it or the very many, many people behind it are omniscient. But if you're going to claim that this universe is built by something omniscient, you're going to have to show that it, there's actually signs of, of omniscience behind it. And the flaws in the design clearly show that that's not the case. And honestly, if we're going to say that atheists have no basis to say anything's right or wrong, isn't all the right or wrong here created by the same creator that theists claim is behind the universe? So what basis do they have to say the same thing? We can actually have arguments about things that are not objective. We do not have to say, oh, because I don't think that there is an objective morality, which, by the way, reality sort of shows that there is no objective morality. People are constantly arguing about what's moral and what's not. If there were an objective morality, we would see it somewhere. But even within the same religions, the same societies, the same political parties, Heck, the same households. You don't see objectivity in morality. It simply is not there. I would like to see where it would be, because I don't see it. But yet we still have conversations about it. And so we can have conversations about things that are not objective. Things like laptops. Maybe I think that an apple is a waste of money, and maybe someone else thinks that it's not. And we can still have a conversation about it, even though it's subjective. As far as natural selection goes, again, we're going back to this fallacy of seeing patterns where there aren't patterns. We're not necessarily selected for karate. Karate is something we've developed because of the bodies that we have. And that can go for almost anything in human civilization. It's not so much that you know, an atheist thinks that we were selected for karate. That's completely ridiculous. Instead, it's that we have developed various forms of martial arts and physical exertion in accordance with our physical abilities. We have developed them. There was no need for an external force to tell us what to do that way. As far as the thought problem goes, your thought corresponds to your perception of reality. So where you would see a grilled cheese, maybe one of my ancestors hundreds of years ago would have seen some weird squishy looking thing in the shape of a square. So our perceptions affect what we see as reality. 
I'm not dealing in truth values here. I'm just talking about what happens in the brain. Interpretation is also a physical mechanism. So it's not that there's some mysterious thing that takes this brain knowledge and makes it into our perception. We have brains for this very reason. We have nervous systems. We have our gut, our digestive system, which also contains a significant uh, concentration of neural tissues. And that's how we interpret the information we are given. And that's where the differences in interpretation come in. What is right? That's a pretty big question, and I don't think that was the topic of our debate either. It's a very large, very sweeping question. But I can tell you that when I did a debate two or three years ago on this very same topic, I could take the theists that I debated, who made very similar arguments to David, and put them together in a room and say, what is right, go. And they would probably spend a long time and never actually come to any agreement, because this other guy was not as nice as David, I'll tell you that. He had completely different arguments and he, he lied to me and deceived me, which I think David would find to be morally reprehensible. Even though I think that the creator that David attributes to this universe created liars and reprehensible people as well. So I'm not sure where you can say it's bad or good since this omniscient deity created it. The bottom line is that, again, when I say I want to be right, what I mean is as close to the best conclusions we're ever going to get to ever. That may sound wishy-washy, that may sound questionable, that may sound confusing, but I think that it's better to accept the fact that there is uncertainty in the universe than to have false certainty. There are a lot of things you don't understand. There are a lot of things that I don't understand. There are a lot of things that our ancestors didn't understand. There are things that human beings will probably kill each other and die out over before we understand them. But that doesn't mean that we have to settle for these explanations that shrink and shrink to even smaller places over time. We can do better. And promoting the idea that there must be some sort of supernatural explanation, in fact, hinders our ability to get closer to understanding more and more. And that is the sad irony of theists using arguments like this, because the intellectual predecessors for these arguments would have hindered the progress of this exact line of thought. Are we ready to let the games begin? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay. Dave, thanks for coming. You've been great. Hina, you've been greater. Sorry, I'm a little biased here. Sorry, a little biased. You're presupposing a standard. Right, yeah. <laughs> My question is that uh, you mentioned all of your arguments about this personal God and about uh, your God, the Christian God, but I'm thinking, and I'll speak in the last question, uh, that you can be a Muslim, you can be a Hindu, you can be a Krishna, you can you know, believe in Krishna, you can believe in Raelians, and all have the same arguments that you're talking about, the theological argument, the fine-tuning, the uh, universe argument, the uh, Kalam argument, all of these things, you could be any other religion and say the exactly the same thing. And that makes me think that, well, your argument isn't that great if all the others have the exactly the same thing. Doesn't it cast doubt on you speaking a Christian viewpoint that can also be argued from any other religion? Well, our topic is does God exist? So, yes, a Muslim and could. I, I have uh, to go to the camera, yeah. so just. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I'll pretend you're still there. And then... <laughs> uh, yes, the, the, the topic is uh, does God exist? And Hina and I were, were discussing a topic and, you know, should we talk about Islam? Should we talk about Christianity? We, we decided we'd talk about kind of a, a, a generic theism. So, uh, yes, personally, me personally, um, I believe God is a, is a trinity and that we would know that Christianity is true by Jesus' resurrection from the dead and, and things like that. Um, but, yes, uh, most of what I've, what I've said tonight could be, uh, you know, uh, a, you know a, a Jew or, or, a, or, a, or a Muslim would, would be perfectly happy with. And I will just add that that actually was what started my path of doubt. I went from a, a Muslim to a generic theist to a deist to, yeah, to what I am now. So, Thank you. And David, you were greater than great. David Akbar. Um, 
I appreciate it, Akbar. <laughs> Uh, my question is this. Uh, you said that you had an internal subjective uh, um, searching, and that is why you left Islam. You started searching within yourself. Can you give any uh, non-subjective personal reasons why you considered the God of Islam not the true God? And have you done this with the Judeo-Christian God, where it's not just a personal subjective reason for your objections? I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Was there any valid, truthful, objective reasons for rejecting theism. I thought that's what this debate was about. <laughs> I thought I, I gave my reasons. They seem to be more personal than... Um, and, and I believe that the reasons given by David for belief are also quite personal. So to single my arguments out as particularly personal, I think, is, is sort of unfair. But I guess to get to your question, I mean, I can't look around at the universe and say that there's some good God that made all of this. There's no way, you know, if, and that this God can abide by a different moral standard than the, the standard that it created for us. And this idea that, you know, People can be punished eternally for reasons that seem rather random and have nothing to do with being good or bad. Um, there are a lot of reasons why. You know, there's no one single reason. But I think it is objectively tr the one objective thing I can say is that I'm pretty sure that if I weren't raised in a society that taught me to believe in a deity, that I would believe in that deity. So that is the one thing that made me really lose my belief in God, is that if I hadn't been taught that belief, I wouldn't have come up with it myself. Anything to add? Uh, not too many people historically, just by you know sitting around thinking, came to the conclusion of atheism. And so that would also seem to be... If you're going to say, well, I wouldn't have come to that conclusion on my own, well, most people historically didn't come to the conclusion of, of atheism, so I would, I would wonder why you now take the position of, of atheism when, when that's a position. Well, because you exist. The theists exist, so an atheist has to exist in order to not believe in that God. I mean, that's why. Um, a couple of quick things. One is, I, I don't know whether Bruce has announced, but several of us are going out to meet the uh, Marie Callender's yes, up the street. Norms. Afterwards. Norms. 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 Sorry. I always screw things up. Okay. At Norms. And so I would really urge for future speakers, I don't want to hear about grilled cheese sandwiches <laughs> at this point. You know, I, Them I, I, spiking I, words where I come from. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the other thing that bothered me in this entire debate was that... Um, no one defined terms. You said well, there's a, a God, all right? And people wandered over, well, probably that God is omniscient and omnipotent. We never really got to omnibenevolent because that's really hard to justify. So um, I would challenge both of you just to spend, you know, one minute. What is this God that you believe in or don't believe in? My answer is very simple. I'm sure yours is a little bit longer. God is a supernatural explanation for natural phenomena that have natural explanations, and that's what I reject. So to me, that includes you know spirituality and all that stuff, too. But I think you have more to say on this. Well, yeah, there's there certain things that can't be explained um, naturally. If they're if you don't have nature, then you can't you know uh, you can't explain something naturally. So when you know beginning of the universe, when nature comes into existence, you can't explain that na naturally because then you'd be appealing to nature to sort of pull itself up by its by its own bootstraps. Um, but yes, you know if 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 we're in a if we're in a debate, if we're in a debate, there's only so much we can cover in a, in, a, in a debate with a 15 minute opening statement. Right, but if so, it's God exists, it seems to me that one would want to define one's term as to what God means to you. Well, yeah, and, and, and again, I, would, I, I believe God is a trinity, that the second person uh, entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth and, and you know, all of these things. But um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're talking about, you know, just God, um, you know, we, we kind of have, and, 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 you know, Hina didn't want to you know, get specific on, on Christianity. Uh, so, you know, we, we just debated the existence of God. But uh, given that there's only so much, if you end up with an omnipotent uh, mind that is the ground of logic and morality and, and so on, you know, 
if that's not God, I don't know, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. It's it's like uh, it's like saying, well, I mean, keep in mind, no matter how no matter how much evidence we give in turn, you know, for the existence of God, you could always say, well, maybe slightly different in some way. Well, guess what? If any of those views is correct, naturalism is false and atheism is false. So, uh, you know, it, it's like we're saying, here are all my reasons for believing in God, and you say, but, you know, you could be off on one of those things and it could be different. Well, regardless, you're wrong. You know what I mean? So it's, it's in, in, in other words, here's what you have. For most people, the, the live options, what William James referred to as the live options, the things that we still consider, you know, on the table as far as worldviews, for most people, it's, it's theism or naturalism, living, living in the West. Um, so anytime we're discussing, those are the issues that are, are going to be on the table, some sort of uh, theism or or you know, a, a naturalism. And other, the other other things, you can say, well, Zeus, you know, but you know, it's not exactly what we're talking about. So if your arguments are equally valid tonight for the existence of Zeus, or I, I, I'm, saying we're, I'm saying, if we're, I'm saying, I'm saying, if we Allah. debate, I'm saying, if we debate the existence of God, and there's enough evidence to show that naturalism is false and that a creator of the universe who's omnipotent and so on uh, and is, uh, you know, the ground of logical, you know, so you laws have, you have and such a morality. Good argument. First, you're going to say God exists, and next if we were, if Jesus. we're, if we're talking about, if we're talking right. about specifics, yes, absolutely. If we're talking about is Christianity true, um, or you know, something like that, then yes, I would, I would argue for that that, okay. that Christianity is true. So, yes, I believe more than we have discussed tonight. My, my beliefs are much more specific on a lot, a lot of issues than than what we've discussed right Thank now. You. And I will say to go back to that other question, nothing makes these agree more than the presence of an atheist. <laughs> Next question. Okay. I'd like to ask one on each side. Um, some might say, from the, um, the atheist standpoint, that uh, a number of the statements that you've made um, seem to uh, bear some sort of subjectivity to them. So I'd like to ask you, what's the most objective thing that you could say in favor of your view? Um, I don't see a lot of subjectivity in most of, of what I've said. When, when I say that the universe had a beginning, that's not, oh, you know, this is my personal feeling or something like that. It's not, it's not what I'm saying. Um, or when I say that, uh, you know, the, the, the cosmological constant is finely tuned to 1 in 10 to the 120th power, that's, that's not something I'm saying, I, I kind of feel like that's, I don't feel like that, I don't, I mean, I, I, you know, I could say I feel like, wow, this universe is really amazing, I can have that sort of subjective uh, experience, um, but when we're, you know, when we're talking about, you know, that, th those are factual statements, those are factual statements, now, this, you know, what you could say is a kind of subjective part is, you know, our interpretation still plays a role. We still have to, we have facts, but we also have to interpret those facts. And so there, there is a, a degree of, you know, personal uh, in interpretation, but, uh, you know, and I, I understand people see things differently, but I, I personally, I, I don't see any other way to go on a lot of, on, on, on a lot of the issues. Response to that? A response to that? Um well, I feel like the interpretation thing is at the heart of, of what I'm what what my argument is essentially that you know we're fallible human beings with our fallible interpretations and one of those interpretations is theism, which you know you can find evidence for if you're really looking for it, I guess. But I don't think necessarily that the evidence on its own leads to that conclusion. Okay, and now the question on this side, um, rather than discussing things having to do with optimality or suboptimality of systems or whether or not the, the fall could explain a, a lot of the things that you were mentioning. Let me ask you just one, uh, one question and a follow-up. Do you believe that information is material? I, I'm not sure how to answer that question because information only exists as we materially talk about it, think about it, transmit it, and there's material behind that. Um, again, I think it's a tree falling in the forest, no one's there to hear it question. I think it's sort of a, an empty question, you know, does it exist without us, it, without us to think it, would it exist? I mean, if we were to decimate or eliminate the entire human population, what would information even be? Um, or I should say the living population because animals also have information that they transmit to each other. So yeah, I guess I just don't see the point in that question. I'm not referring to the means of transmission of the information, but the information itself. It would not exist without us there to talk about it, think about it, transmit it. 
Uh, no, I mean, in, information is, 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 is quantifiable. Um, you can say, well, we wouldn't know that it's, it's quantifiable if we weren't there. But uh, so, you know, DNA, if there were no human beings, uh, DNA is still coded information, right? It, it's a set of instructions for, uh, for, for proteins, for, for putting together amino acids into proteins. So information is, is, is something real. It's not, it's not the matter itself. It's kind of the arrangement of matter if it has some sort of meaningful, uh, you know, some sort of meaningful pattern. Um, and yeah, again, something like something like DNA has a uh, is it's coded information. Um, you know, if all human beings die tomorrow, there's still information on this on this laptop that is that is it, it's an arrangement. It's an arrangement of of matter. There are things that are meaningful to to certain perceptions and not meaningful to others. So again, I don't really know why why we would bother with information that's just lying there with no one there to interpret it. You know, it's just kind of there. Shortly. Jump, jump, jump. <laughs> One word at a time. <laughs> um, so I apologize. I came in a little, a little late. I missed all of your introduction. I think. Oh, I it was awesome. Yours. It I'm was so, so sorry. Awesome. <laughs> I thought pride was a sin. I missed the best part. <laughs> it, it, it was my. It was. It was the best moment ever. But I did come in. I think about halfway through yours, and something struck me in something that you said. You were talking about uh, not necessarily needing to know. Um, everything about how your computer worked or about the guy that made the thing that landed on the Mar on Mars and that we didn't necessarily need to know that. We just needed to be able to use our computer or our smartphone. Do you remember saying that? That, that, that I think is a mischaracterization of what I said. Okay. I, I'm just saying that we don't know. There's no way that all of us can know everything. Okay, and that, and that's true. But somebody does know those things. The guy that made our smartphone knows it. Mm -hmm. And the guy that made the device that landed on Mars knows it. Right. Because somebody designed those things. Right. And who made the universe knows the, the universe. Right. Because... I, I reject the premise that someone made it. But... <laughs> yeah, I no, feel I under, like that's... I understand <laughs> that you reject that premise, but what yeah. I'm saying is that the other things that you were talking about have a design to them. Right. And what I don't understand is why everything else in the universe has a design. Everything else that you're talking about has a design. But you reject the premise that the most incredibly designed thing that there is doesn't have a design. So you're starting with the premise that it's incredibly designed, which I spent this entire debate addressing and expressing my reasons for not believing in. If you can't accept those reasons, then I'm afraid we're at an impasse. But the reason I brought up technology was not to say that it's just like the universe and that it's designed, but more to say that there are things that we don't understand and we're comfortable with them. And that just because you don't understand human evolution or astrobiology or astrophysics or any of those things doesn't mean that you have to shoehorn in an explanation that you do understand, which is a deity. So that's what that's the point I was trying to make, not that the universe was designed. And again, I spent this entire debate making my points about that. I don't know if I can rehash them all in, in no, the q &A. No, I'm not asking you to rehash them, but what I'm saying is that we are more designed than a computer. I disagree with that premise. Again, I, I think a computer has more design than we do. It has human design that we can trace, that we can look at. Human beings evolve through a process of natural selection that I can prove to you with biological evidence. It's not someone sitting down and making a person. There's no evidence of that. There is evidence of my smartphone was made by a slave in China. <laughs> But you know, there's no evidence that someone sat down and, and shaped a person. There's no evidence of that. Um, there's evidence of natural selection, which can be explained naturalistically. Okay. And David, how would you speak to that? Um, I would. Uh, I, I would disagree that that life um, doesn't need uh, a designer. Another, granting everything that that Hina just said about natural selection, you know, selecting, um, you know, traits and so on, for for evolution even to get started, for the process even to begin, you need something very specific. Um, you, need, uh, you need life, and it needs to be of a very particular sort. Um, it needs to 
when it just happens to come into existence, it has the ability already to make copies of itself, right? So it's not just something that has a metabolism. It's something that uh, also has the ability to make copies of itself. They can't be exact copies or, there, or there'd be no variation. There'd be no variation for natural selection to act on. Uh, but they can't be extremely different because if they're extremely different, it wouldn't, it wouldn't preserve the, the beneficial traits. So at the very beginning of the process, uh, you need something we need something very specific. And when you, when you get down into what would be required to have that sort of thing, the simplest known life, uh, the simplest life that we, we know about is a, is, a, is a bacterium in uh, the urinary tract. And uh, it has about 400 medium length, uh, if, if, if you're on average, about 400 medium length uh, proteins. And given the amount of time that you've had in the universe. So you, you can actually calculate the number of possible interactions since the beginning of the universe. You can say, here's the number of seconds since the beginning of the universe. Here are the number of particles in the universe. And here is the fastest rate of interactions of particles. So you set the speed of light as a limit to how fast things can move. Uh, total number of particles, total number of seconds um, since the beginning of the universe. And you don't get any anywhere near the time required to produce one protein by chance, not one. Um, and so the idea that you could get enough to create an entire uh, living organism all in the same place at the same time, and then it gets bound together and then goes on, uh, I would say well, this, isn't, this isn't just there's no need for, there's no reason to think that there's a, a designer required here because that most basic living organism uh, is like a little city. Um, and I'd say, I would agree with you that it's much more, uh, much more shocking than, than a laptop. Hey, that's, that's why we need the multiverse theory. <laughs> Oh, but, but I, I, I love multiverse theory because anytime someone goes multiverse, uh, well, I get to do that too, right? So anytime you're, hey, I don't, if we're talking about optimal design or I don't like the way that's designed, maybe God designed an infinite array of universes and ours is just one and he, he selected that way of doing ours and selected God, what a sadist. What a sadist to do that. Jeez. But, uh, but I have to point out that um, nobody is claiming that life just emerged. You know, there were proto, I mean, you talked about the urinary, urinary tract organism. That's not the simplest form of life we know about. There are evidence for even more simpler forms of life. What? There was proto, there were prototypes to that, which were essentially just strands of DNA. Like, I'm not a biologist, so I'm not going to necessarily you know, say I know everything about this. I'm comfortable with uncertainty and not knowing everything. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that, you know, I'm proposing that, you know, proteins just randomly bound together out of nowhere is not. Well, no, you, you have the simplest known life, which, is, which has about, about That's four, alive about right now. Yeah, but, but it has they, evolved for the last I know, but no, yeah. No, let, let me, yeah, let me, yeah, let, no, let me finish. They You've did, had a lot of time. They, they do knockout experiments where they say, what could something survive without? And you still get down to about 250 proteins uh, that you need for any sort of thing that would qualify as life. You know, there's not and, just and before that, DNA. and before that, there was prototypes of that via, you know, there, there is evidence for this. And again, no, no, I'm not, not, not a biologist. I, I'm no, saying we, okay. we, 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 we agree, we agree on things and disagree on things, but yeah, no, there's no. not on that no, one. Okay. In your first rebuttal, you mentioned there is no such thing as a mental state. You said there's a physical state and that a mental state is strictly a phenomena of a predictable mental state? I want to know, did I um, it's, it's more that a physical state. There cannot be a, a, a mental state in and of itself? It has a physical, physical it, it is a physical thing, is what I'm saying. This idea, that I, I don't agree with dualism. There's not a mind and a body. The, the mental state you're experiencing is a physical state. Okay, which then would suggest that all emotional experience can be predicted from physical indicators. You would believe that? I don't have to believe that. You, you think that's true? Absolutely. Okay. I'd like for you to explain the mechanism not behind attraction, not behind arousal, but the physical and physiological phenomena that occurs 
and can be observed in the mental state of love. Serotonin, oxytocin, probably some chemicals I forget because I'm not a biologist. Okay. If that were true, mm -hmm. we could predict who would fall in love and be in love with another human being because you're suggesting how much serotonin, how much dopamine, how much epinephrine, how much caffeine, how much oxytocin. I don't think that's correct. So what's your definition of love if not a mental state? It's a mental state that is physical. A mental state is a physical state. And I think you're misunderstanding. You're talking about very complex sociobiological phenomena. People fall in love, and you can predict who falls in love with whom. In fact, you can look at the sociological data. You're far more likely to fall in love with someone who's in the same social class as you. There's no magic behind that. It's just who you happen no, to meet. Bonding and pairing isn't the same as love. Oxy right. But Oxytocin I mean, is, you know, we're talking about the hormone that's released during lactation and breastfeeding. Uh, in addition to many, many, many other states, yes. Cuddling does it too. So, so love is a predictable phenomena. You would That's say. not what I say. What I'm saying is that it's a physical. Okay, so you're proposing it's a mechanistic. You, you basically said it can be it can be predicted. With I I never said it can be predicted. That okay. Phenomenon. So let me explain myself again in case this is unclear. Sure. A mental state is a physical state. One has feelings, and those feelings are shown in brain scans. And what I'm saying is that a mental state is not a separate thing. It is part of your physical being. Your brain is part of your body. And so to talk about love is to talk about a very complex thing. What kind of love? Falling in love versus experiencing feelings of love, those are all separate things. But that, that isn't to say that I can predict who's going to fall in love with who. I'm not God. If we're going to make a joke here, you know, I'm not anybody. But the bottom line is that a mental state is a physical state. You can measure that thing that's happening in your brain as you feel love. Prediction? That's beyond me. That's beyond anyone, if we're being honest here, right? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Hina on, on, on a lot of what she said. Uh, the, the view she's defending is called identity theory. I, uh, uh, mental states are identical with physical states. It's it's one of the, the leading views. Um, uh, and you know, not being able to predict something that's a, it's a you know we you know we can't exactly predict the weather, all kinds of things. That doesn't mean um, that things don't have a physical basis. So uh, so you know the real the real question is once you have because we know uh, among the things we know we know that there is uh, obviously uh, a close relationship between uh, physical states and mental states with things like pain. You can actually you know you can actually do brain scans and so on. So the question is is there anything left over and uh, so the person who's making the argument for a kind of dualism has to you know that, that would have to show that there are uh, certain properties of mental states that cannot be described in physical terms that's that's how you would do that um, but as far as something like love goes uh, you know maybe I tell my wife tonight I uh, serotonin and dopamine her very, very much Hey, thanks. I'm glad to be a guest here tonight, and I wanted to thank all the, the hosting different people. Um, it's my first time at one of these debates, so I didn't really know what to expect. Um, so I don't want to be critical. <laughs> but I know I'm ugly. Okay, say it. Okay, you don't have to. First, first of all, let me say that I'm definitely a skeptic, but I'm also definitely a Christian. Uh, and I think those two things aren't incompatible. Um, I don't know how other people feel about that, but that's okay. Um, I was going to say, just constructively, and, uh, and boy, oh, well, first of all, I really liked hearing both of you, and I feel like I could spend time eating and talking with uh, with you guys for eat individually for hours about various things. Um, I don't know everything there is to know, um, and I, I don't. Uh, I, I feel like I'd like to though. <laughs> Uh, I'd, I'd like to understand all the processes and you know how laptops work and whatnot. Um, uh, a constructive thing, um, 
in future debates, I would think that maybe it'd be good to um, have sources ready to cite uh, because people like to hear, um, you know, why something is authoritative and, or what research has been done. Point Stand to an article. Question, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, my question is this. Uh, it seems that, because uh, I had a lot of other questions too, but anyway, uh, uh, you're both starting with the presupposition, it seems, that uh, the point of life um, is uh, efficiency, survival, uh, not death. Um, and I wonder if, if we supposed that the point of life, the point of being created was uh, to glorify God or any other reason. Um, and that would, you know, strangely be through uh, death and misery and other things um, and mysteries to us. Would your arguments change? Would you, uh, would you argue differently? if you weren't supposing efficiency was the ultimate goal? So. Um, I think there's a conflation of point, meaning, goal, and just what evolution does. I, I wouldn't say that the point of life is to reproduce and stay alive. I would say that's what life does. That's, that's what evolution leads to. As far as a point or meaning or anything in life, I don't think I could tell you what yours should be. I don't think anyone can tell anyone else what they should be. And even people within the same religion, you know, fight over what the point is, what's the most important thing. Um, but if I could just speak personally for a moment here and step away from object objectivity, um, I don't think it's efficiency. I don't think it's spreading my genes, otherwise I would have had like 10 kids by now. Um, I, I think the point for me is really to spread to, to, to reduce harm where I see it and to spread whatever good I can. And I can't say that I'm doing the best job at it, but I'm trying and I'm pretty certain that I am doing a halfway decent job of it in certain areas of my life. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you completely that I don't believe that you know, efficiency or even survival are you know, the, the, the most important things. Um, the most important things in life, and that you know, once you once you have an idea, this is what's most important in life. Uh, you know, that can that can change a lot of interpretations. Uh, as far as the discussion tonight goes, it's the, the idea of efficiency and uh, survival, and why doesn't God help survival more and reproduction more? These are exactly the sorts of of values that, if if you take naturalism seriously, you say these are the sorts of things that would. Um, be wired into us the way you know you know bird is is wired to build a nest or something like that we would be wired to survive and reproduce and so our values would center around those things and that since we know where those values come from those aren't the sorts of things that you can then say but those are the things that that god must make the center of uh, you know his purposes and so on um but you know, that's what atheists generally tend to do. It's here's what's important to us, which if we follow our beliefs through to the logical conclusion, these are just the things that, you know, according to our worldview, we would, uh, you know, expect to, to, to make central. And then applying them to God as if they're, they're objective. And, and, and as Hayden has pointed out, there, she doesn't believe in objective morality. And so what sense does it make to apply these things to God? But we, we just can't get away from it. We, we can't get away from thinking in terms of their sort of absolute right and, and wrong. And the point is that the absolutes don't fit with one world view that's, that's on the table. Well, I mean, y'all are the ones who call God good. I mean, you're proposing relativism by saying one morality applies to God and one applies to people. So I, I would say that that's the case there, too. No, if, if we defined good in terms of, and I've never met a Christian who defines good in terms of maximizing our pleasure and comfort and minimizing our, uh, our, our pain and struggle. I've never met a person who, I mean, a Christian or theist uh, in general who defines 
God that way. So it's we say God is good, yes, and you know we're thinking in terms of you know holiness. So good's and a completely like that. meaningless term then. Uh, no, it's 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 not a hedonistic term. It's not if you and it, it's no coincidence that the first example of an argument from evil that we have on record was uh, Epicurus, um, who's you know the, the father of a, a kind of hedonism. Uh, once you take pleasure as you know the highest good or you know anything that's associated with it then of course you're going to run into all sorts of problems if that's how you're defining good and then saying god is good i never posited but, pleasure as the highest no good. no no, no I'm, not, I'm not i'm talking uh, you, like how about not spontaneously miscarrying how about that like i don't think that's that radical to say that that's a good according to give, your god given as your, a matter of fact given your worldview it's 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 very radical if but you're I'm, saying, I'm if running you're saying, with your worldview here when when you talk about your God, if you're talking about my worldview, we're a bunch of sinners, and God can allow all sorts of things because we're not. We're, you know, it, that's his fault, though, right? Didn't he make you that way? He made us sinners. Yeah, that's pretty sick yeah, to make you know. sinners and say, "Let's torture you now because no, you're I don't sinners." Think so. um, well, I, I don't know. It seems pretty sadistic to me. But by the way, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, this whole forum. I really, really do. I, I, I appreciate the civility. Uh, Hina, thank you very much for being here, David. Um, my question is this. It seems as though that we've spent a lot of time on design. We've talked a lot about um, the fine-tuning of things and what have you. Uh, my question is um, origins. And we could probably spend another two or three hours here when we talk about origins. But it seems to me, and one of the challenges I have with the atheistic point of view is that um, it seems when we talk orange origins, uh, what happens in, is that that the the arguments I've had or the discussions I've had with atheists, um, what gets ushered in is more process. So, for instance, I could say, well, I'm going to go over and get a Betty Crocker cake. I'm going to bake a cake, and my friend is going to bake one from scratch. But the presupposition is, well, it's not really from scratch. Then, boom, there's a cake. I had the eggs, I had the flour, I had the, the milk and what have you. So the question is, I'm not sure if I've got a question, but the question is coming back, we, we, to usher back to the beginning, the very beginning, I could say, well, goodness, you know, the first day was, was this or whatever, but I, I needed some kind of ingredient to get to that first day. So I guess I'll throw it to you, Hina, first, and mm -hmm. David, you could respond there as well. I'm not sure if that's a real articulate question, I, I see but if I what you know where I'm headed. I, yeah, I see what you're saying, where that, you know, there has to be something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like the fact that we're relying on analogies like cakes or, or whatever else, or, you know, things like that, just sort of shows the limitations of the human mind in a lot of ways, that we can't conceive of, of certain things. And again, to go back to my arguments about technology, that wasn't, you know, the point of that was to say that there's a lot of things we don't get. There are a lot of things that certain of us can't get. And, you know, there are cosmologists, people who study the origins of the universe, who keep pushing further and further back and figuring out more and more about the origins of the universe. They haven't found God yet, but they found, they found other things. And so I've just sort of made my peace with the fact that that's not where my mind goes and that the human mind may never fully comprehend that. But I choose not to fixate on that and use that as a basis for my life and to use other things, I guess. Well, may I ask, why would you not take the agnostic position rather than the atheistic position? They're not mutually exclusive. Um, atheism is to live without theism, to live without the belief in a deity, and that's what I do. Um, agnosticism is to say that I can't know for certain. I'm an agnostic atheist. I say I'm an atheist so that people don't think I'm open to them preaching at me randomly. Because for some reason people think agnostic means preach to me. And I, I'm, I'm often not in the mood. I have other things to do. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I got your point exactly. Yeah, I'm but not sure I articulated yeah. it well. Okay, either, so, that's okay. <laughs> so I'll I'll go with what I what I, what I got here. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I've I've never I've never understood the the sort of response that's um, okay. Here's something. So just use the laptop as an example again. Uh, if I want to understand how this laptop came to be, well, you know, I just understand. It requires a cause. It requires a designing intelligence. I, I understand those that, that, that it's goal-directed, that there's a purpose towards it. Um, it would never cross my mind to say, well, 
but I can think of a better one. Therefore, none of that, none of that is the case. And you know, er, earlier Hina pointed out, well, it's because we're not attributing omniscience to the designer. That, that's that, that's not the reason, right? Because, could, could Apple design a better one? Yes. Could they design one that's ten times better? Absolutely. Well, why don't they? Uh, well. A Apple, we would if even if we have no clue, right, about cost constraints and so on, we'd say, even if we had no idea what the reasons were, you would still say, you know, well, they obvi this obviously has a, a designing intelligence and a cause and so on, and whatever their reasons for doing things in this way, they must have reasons. So, in other words, if you have a cause that can produce the effect, but you might not understand exactly why it's like that, rather than someone else, uh, I mean, wh rather than some other way. Uh, I think you still have to say, okay, well, that's a cause that explains the effect. I might not understand, but those are in the realms of reasons. Um, I can't understand your reasons for doing anything, let 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 alone God's reasons for I doing everything. Time enough yeah. figuring out my own reasons for things. So it's it's weird. Yeah, it's weird to say I don't understand the the reasons for doing this. Therefore, nothing of that sort exists, and therefore, it's just a big puzzle how how we got it. That that's 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 my thinking. And I think it comes back to human the human limitation that we have where we look for patterns and seek seek order and reason and things that don't necessarily have them. So I think, it, from my perspective, that's what happens with, with theism, where we're looking for a reason. We're looking for a way to figure out. But that's just the human thing. And it, it's what makes society so great. It's what makes civilization so great. We figure things out. But I don't know if we really have it figured out there. Great. Thank you. We have five more minutes for questions. I do see two individuals in line, so be mindful of we have five more minutes because some of our faces of the audience, they look hungry. So five more minutes for questions. Go ahead and approach the podium, please. Hey. Hello. Uh, my question is for David. David, um, I just noticed that you didn't say anything biblical from the Bible. Is there a reason for that debate? Because aren't we supposed to witness also to people that don't know the Bible? Like when she was asking about the sinful thing, uh, we all fall short of the glory of God. That's what you know the answer would be. I, so. I take I take issue with that because as a Muslim, I heavily studied your Bible, so I am oh, aware. Bible. Huh? You read the whole Bible? Not the entire thing. You haven't read the whole Quran either, or the entire Vedas, or the entire all the Buddhist scriptures that exist, or all the Hindu scriptures that exist. Right. Um, yet you feel Bible. fit to reject them. But I've read a decent chunk of the Bible. I got really bored at the begats. I'm sorry, um, but I've read enough of the Bible. So please don't. Don't condescendingly assume I need to be told. I, I really don't appreciate that. Okay. But you, you, you could be referring to the audience in general, right? Yeah, and, and by the way, well, you, you, looked at, you looked at, God, you, you yeah. talked to yeah. me, though. You talked uh, to me. That's Romans 323. Well, you don't have to agree with it. That's all there is. Yeah, well, we, 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 we have to agree to a topic, and we have to, we have to uh, you know, stick to a topic. And when we're, we're talking about uh, topics, Hina said, hey, how about something on Islam? I said, I don't think we're going to disagree much on Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was, uh, well, I don't really, in, you shouldn't want to talk about Christianity uh, either. And then so how about the existence of God? And that's something we just, we just agreed with. Um, but, you know, if, 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 if we made an agreement ahead of time, I'm not going to then go on and, hey, my main argument for the, 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 the existence of God now is, uh, is the resurrection of Jesus. Um, but but with your assumption is, you know, uh, that that's the whole purpose and um you know you can you, you can do kind of one thing at a time like if our debate is is there a supernatural world uh, is there something supernatural i'd be totally comfortable de debating is there something supernatural uh, because it shows that another worldview is false and you know if the competing there's only there's only there are only so many competitors on the table uh so even if you don't you know prove the gospel or something like that mm. um it is still meaningful it is still meaningful to say this other worldview is incoherent and doesn't doesn't fit well and there, therefore it's false and therefore people need to uh pick something that is not part of that that worldview. So, so, yeah. And and but I under, I understand I understand your point. I just think that there because and I'm going with my own thought processes. Um, I started having lots of doubts about naturalism, and you know that you know that put other options on the table and so on. And that's part of the reason I was I started to seriously consider Christianity. Right. Um, so, I think people can go stepwise. Yeah. So. Right. And uh, the other one is uh, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. I'm done. Thank you. Yes, well, I want to thank both of you for... The man in black. <laughs> for coming. Yeah, I never trust anybody wearing black. Um, 
by the way, uh, just really want to thank you for being here. Uh, that table there, the, all of those are free if anybody wants to take something on Common Core. And uh, I think it's been a great evening. You guys have done a wonderful job. So I just want to th say thanks for coming. All right. Right. Thanks for coming. I have a quick comment and a quick question. Sir, I can't understand what you're saying with your accent. <laughs> Let me speak. It's my friend. I mess with him right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd rather keep my French accent than rather than have a West Virginian accent. Yeah. Um, okay. so, Can we cut the mics? This guy's very rude. and <laughs> We only have three minutes, so let me talk. So um, the quick comment is mm -hmm. you talked about um, the... Um, the fact that uh, you know because we have to kill in order to eat that somehow that would you know uh, show a nature of God that would uh, not be uh, benevolent and good right so my comment is that you know uh, is that there is such a thing in the Bible as free moral agency and also the fact that we sin and so uh, that's something that's uh, opposed to to Islam where uh, where the Bible explains that that God created us good but then we chose freely to walk away from 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 God and that's where when death entered you know to answer the question when you you mentioned you talked about the killing of animals and you know killing we have to kill in order to to survive and to you know to, to feed I, I don't have a choice in I mean I can go vegetarian which I was vegan for a year and I didn't kill any animals to eat but I had to kill plants mm -hmm. I don't have a choice unless I want to die which I don't mm -hmm. so I you know and you can say oh in the Bible it explains because of Adam and Eve and free will and all that that still doesn't negate my point that we have to eat other living things sure. to survive that is required for human beings you know, unless technology gets great, which I'm hoping for. Right. And my question, very quickly, I know we're, we're, we're pretty much finished. The question I had was that you basically talked about, you know, that uh, there's basically no objective moral standard and uh, absolutes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And um, and then, then you mentioned the uh, basically, uh, if David was here with the last person you deb debated, they would basically not agree on many things, right? But they would d disagree. Yeah. Up to many things, Absolutely. which is true, right? Uh -huh. But then, wouldn't you agree that there are some uh, moral laws that are objective and universal, such as murdering of a child and raping? People do that. God told people to do that, so there is subjectivity. I'm not saying that. Okay, if 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 I were in any position to say that we ought to have certain objective moral standards. Oh yeah, if I were a grand dictator of the world, I'd be like, yes, let's not kill and rape kids. That's awful, we should not do that. But when we look at the living morality that exists in the world, the way it is practiced, there is obviously subjectivity, including within the very texts of the religions that allegedly are true. So, you know, but I'm not I'm not you know, I'm not here to defend my right, I'm asking right. you to def to uh, to re to tell me if you believe there is an objectivity to the morality. There, if there is such a There moral. is no evidence for an objective morality because no one practices any objective morality. Everyone disagrees. It's all pretty darn subjective for the most part. And there are some things that seem to be relatively to use a pun, universal, but even then you see exceptions to it being made in the name of morality. So I think that morality in that way is objectively subjective. And I'm in no position to say we ought to have these objective principles, because obviously that's not how it plays out. Um, I, all I can go with is say for me personally, I try to look for ways to reduce harm, but I, I can't say there's an objective morality because it doesn't exist. Tell me where to find it. Yeah. Uh, I hope uh, I hope no one here has a different uh, different subjective uh, preference for you know chopping people's heads off tonight. Because we can't say ISIS is really wrong then, right? You know what I mean. 
Oh, come on. I'm the one they would go for first. You're going to play no, this No, no, no. I am higher up on their list. Oh, I I'm guarantee an, I'm an you I'm higher up on their list. No, 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 no. Apostates die before I the infidels. I criticize Muhammad on a daily basis. And, and I left Islam. Islamically speaking, you have a chance of heaven. I don't. I actually am supposed to have been killed eight years ago, three years after I first renounced my no, faith. No, 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 I commit shirk. That's, that's the unforgivable no, 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 no. sin. But my, but mine is more unforgivable. Apostasy listen, is more forgivable. Listen, listen. If, if I were ISIS... Muslim, I would behead you both. <laughs> and, and you know what? And you would be morally wrong. <laughs> Wow, thank you very much. Another round of applause for our panelists here. 